Hello and welcome to Board Game Bonkers and JCS. This is Under the Maple Light Show and today's guest we have Martin Wallace who's a board game designer and designed the number one board game on Board Game Geek currently, Brass. Welcome, Martin. Hi, Jay. Uh, thank you for inviting me onto your show. Uh, pleasure to be here. And thanks so much for joining us. So why don't you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Oh, God. That's a difficult question. Um, yeah, full-time game designer. Um, been doing this since 1990. Um, got a lot of games to my name, like like Brass, Discworld, Ankmore Port, Age of Steam, Stroke Steam, A Few Acres of Snow, Anno 1800. Um, the list goes on. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm a full-time game designer, and I'm living out in the wilds in Australia at the moment, um, which is cool. Actually, it's quite warm, even though it's winter, but it's still cool. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I remember my, my days in Australia. It, uh, mm. It's really hot indeed, especially for our UK people. Oh, yeah, yeah. Summer is a nightmare because uh, everything, just the humidity is crazy, and it's just not kind to cardboard. It's just... Australia is not kind to cardboard and it's really annoying when you've got these uh, old games you collection and you open them up after a couple of years and you find out that it's been the home for some paper wasps which love getting into boxes and laying their eggs so yeah it's not not a not a game friendly environment <laughs> one to watch for a few people taking a trickle and then <laughs> So uh, I'll just explain for our viewers that yeah, perhaps are just cutting this video, I'm not familiar with the format. We will be on nine questions out of this pot. Now, I well, guess there's no idea what questions are, but mostly the whole game industry. But instead of drawing a tent question, we'll be drawing a scenario instead. Now, our guess has no idea what the scenario is. In fact, we have no idea what the scenario is either. So this will be fun and enjoyable, this experience. So as we go along, what we'll be doing is starting to draw our first question. Now, of course, we'll keep this nice and laid back. We have no idea coming out. So, will our guests thrive when the maple lights are? Will Mark be a little bit nervous? Well, we're about to find out as we draw our first question. So, Martin, are we ready? I'm ready. Go for it. And, so, let's go into question number one. Let's see what we've got and what comes out of the pot. So, we've got a couple of flu there. So, we've got quite a big one here. So, what are the key considerations you keep in mind while designing a board game to ensure it provides an immersive and enjoyable experience. Okay, <clears throat> um, start with a hard one. Actually, it's quite easy this because I um, very often do talks to aspiring game designers, and one of the points I, I make over and over again, which I try to stick to, is just to be very clear about the story you're trying to tell. You know, it's just work out what, what is the story? What is this game about? And it's surprising the number of game designers or, or games that you play where they lose track of that. And th which is why sometimes there's a disconnect between the mechanisms and the theme. Um, so yeah, I, and I have to keep reminding myself of that. Uh, one example I use is a game I've been working on with my friend, uh, Amanda Milne from Shill Mill. We, we did Australia together. And we've been working on a game together called Monster Rock, which is a mashup of Dungeons and Dragons and Spinal Tap, basically. It's and the first versions were okay, but not amazing. And then I realized I'd not worked out the story. And I just did any old thing. I just stuck whatever I felt like into it. And I thought, I need to go and work out what the story is. So I went away and did a whole ton of reading. I read stories about the Beatles, the Rolling Stones. Uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, Jimi Hendrix, and so on. And that gave me the story. Because uh, the thing that I'd missed was that uh, in the 1960s, so th th this game is basically, the idea is it's a Dungeons and Dragons world, but it's now the 1960s. So people are now not going through dungeons or whatever. They, you know, they, they've invented rock music. And the thing that I'd missed was the fact that the 1960s were a period of revolution, uh, even though it didn't actually happen. There was a lot of tension in the air, and I found it. Well, that's my way in, because the game is not just about playing gigs and trying to make the most money. It's about playing gigs to get followers to take down this evil king, to take down the man. And I kind of that's my story. Um, and that 
massively improve the game. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd always say be very clear on the story you're trying to tell. Next question. It's, um, want to follow up? Well, it's it's quite interesting because you've got uh, I know the channel Think of Thema. You've got one who likes the theme more than the other. Mm. One who likes the mechanics more mm. than the other. I have a lot of Euro gamers who like the mechanics more than the theme. And I remember mm. when I was playing that I was all about the mechanics. Now I want the theme to tie mm. into them. Yeah, I, I, I mean, again, normally when I get this question, theme or mechanics first, 99% of the time I start with a theme. Um, and I suppose that's just the way I prefer to do things. Um, and you do everything you can within the game to service that theme. Um, and that, that can sometimes skew the game, you know, in, in odd ways. Um, but it, it's also quite a difficult thing to do, which I think is why some other designers, they prefer, you know, it's, it's going with a, oh, I've got a neat mechanic, what theme can I put on top? Um, but no, I'm, I'm, I prefer theme. Um, and it does kind of frustrates me and annoys me. There's a lot of, games you know because i try to play games you know recent games that come out and it does frustrate me that they may say they're about such and such a theme but that doesn't come out with the mechanics and i, I don't think i'm somebody that can just appreciate mechanics for the sake of appreciating mechanics i want to feel in the theme you know to some degree um so yeah uh, okay Good points, it's exactly good points, and worth mm. uh, up and coming designers to take note of that. So, let's move on to mm. our question, Martin. So, mm. it's a nice, uh, nice question to get into, and um, I'm sure there'll be lots of people out there interested in all the, the designing concept that you go under when you uh, create games. So, question number two is Which games do you play at Christmas? So any particular games you pick for Christmas time? Um, okay, well. My wife, Julia, is not generally a gamer. So the only games we generally play when we're together, she likes she likes word games. So we Bananagrams is a one we enjoy a lot, card games. And she also likes um, this game, I, in fact, Genial, which I think the English name is Ingenious, um, which Rainer Knizia designed back, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so if we're playing together, those are the kind of games we play. Otherwise, at Christmas, um, yeah, I mean, we do. I do get together with gaming friends, but there is no difference to what we play at Christmas to the, what we would play at any other time of the year. So there's no special Christmas games. There's no, oh, let's crack out the Monopoly because that brings back happy memories. Um, it's just what whatever we're enjoying at the moment. Yeah, it can be it can be tough, can't it? When you uh, you got in the table there's a lot of non-gamers that they what do you bring out and a lot of people would choose part of games wouldn't they because they're quite enjoyable engaging um yeah there's um i mean i, I try and do a bit of there, there's uh i'm part of a um reading club up in Mullaney, and um first time i've ever joined a reading club it's weird being forced to read books that i wouldn't normally read but i thought it'd be good for me um and i've actually started introducing them two games, you know, I'll just, because we have a WhatsApp thing, and I'll just say, yeah, does anybody want to meet up at the pub and play games? And what I do is I take along really light stuff. So things like Just One, I found Just One is a really good way of introducing people to games because it's just very simple, cooperative, so there's no bad feeling if you lose, and it's just got a really nice twist. Um, I've also taught them things like um, Bluff, or Perudo, uh, the you know, Lies Dice, um, what else? And I think, yeah, we also tried Six Nymphed, or Take Six. So so that's nice. So they, I, and they really enjoyed that. So um, I, I tried to, you know, I, I do have a collection of simple games that I use to introduce people to. I, there's also, it, it stopped running now, but because my wife is vegan. And so I got involved through some people she knew. I got involved with a vegan games club in, in Brisbane. And again, it's the same thing. These were people who were there not because they were gamers. They were there because they were vegans. So I'd go down there. And again, I'd take all these really nice, light, simple games down and uh, introduce them to them, teach them these games. Because even even simple games to people who are not used to playing games, it's like, ooh, can be, you know, a little bit of a jump, you know, a little bit of a barrier there. And what's kind of interesting from that is that some of those people 
uh, express an interest to learning more about games. It's like, oh, you want to know about the, the you know the deeper games, do you know? There's the darker, more complex games. And so now I have a, a group of vegan friends who come up occasionally, stay for the weekend, or I go down to their house stay for the weekend, and then so I've introduced them to more complex games like terraforming Mars and Terra Mystica and Power Grid and things like that. And they've really taken to those. And now they're exploring that world themselves and, and building up their own collections of more complex games. Yeah, so I'm doing my bit, doing my bit. It's great to get more people into the game away from the video mm. screen TVs and let's get them to mm. the table. Yep. So uh, that's fantastic. So let's move on to question with Baron. Let's see what comes out. That was a nice, mm. nice fucking question. Oz. The question three is, what's a strategy you found helpful in your recent work when designing games? Um, okay, there's two general principles, including this idea of being very clear about the story you're trying to tell. Um, you, you try to make sure that whatever project you're going to work on um, has the potential to see, succeed in the marketplace. So you have to envision, envision what will this product look like on the shop shelf? Will it be appealing? Will it stand out from the competition? So, so what it means is there's certain games you think, yeah, I, I'm not even going to go there because there's already a gazillion games like that. So for instance, I wouldn't go anywhere near a Carcassonne style tile laying game because there's already loads of them. Um, similarly, I wouldn't, you know, there's a lot of Polyonimo games at the moment. There's a lot of um, roll and write games. And I kind of think th those areas are taken so that there's no point in going there. You, you have to find um, other patches that maybe haven't been developed so much. Um, and so, um, so it's kind of thinking through what things have not been done a lot of and then working out what games, especially you know, given that you're trying to make money at this, you know, what games have a significant upside where if they are successful, that the complexity of the game won't limit their success. So as, as an example of this, uh, as you may or may not be aware, they're running a campaign for the Fighting Fantasy Adventure card game. On GameFound at the moment, only two days to go, or one and a half days to go, um, you get more time over there because you're behind us. So... Um, and that is a um, kind of choose your own adventure game uh, done using cards where you have a, two decks of cards, one card forms the dungeon layout, and you have another deck of cards that tells you what's going on. And I've tried to keep it as simple as possible because I, I, I have this feeling that there is a market there for a simple role-playing game for those people who are interested in the idea of role-playing but are put off by the complexity of Dungeons and Dragons or, or don't have a games master. Uh, and also might also be put off the complexity of things like Gloomhaven. And I can't see anything else in this area of the market uh, at the moment, as far as I'm aware. I mean, I may, I may be that informed, but I can't see any other product like this. So for me, I'm thinking, yeah, th this is something to put a lot of effort into, which I have done a lot of effort and a lot of money because I think there is a significant upside there. Um, so, so that's, that's the key thing, is trying to make sure that what you work on has potential appeal on, on the shop shelf. Um, the other principle I, I generally follow with most of my games, not, not all of them, but is doing research, um, reading, um, which is kind of like going back to the Monster Rock game. I could have just done that without doing any reading at all. But reading really helps. So... Um, I really, you know, let's say, yeah, I do enjoy the research process. I, I think it's like, yeah, pick on a theme and then read about it. So it's like uh, one, one of the games I've got planned uh, in the future, uh, kind of working on a series of um, civilization games. None of them have come out yet, but I've got this number of civilization games. I've done the first one, the second one's done. And the third one that, so the first one is kind of ancient period, well, early Bronze Age, second period is Roman period. The third one is going to be the medieval uh, period because I kind of figure you stop at 1492 because you can't go there anymore. 
for you know whatever reason so and i've just been doing so much reading on it i've got so many books on the medieval period it's unbelievable but it's only through doing that reading that you can get a feel for the period and work out what elements of the story you want to tell um and again, I, I'm not always convinced that, you know, when certain game designers come to do a theme, I think sometimes I play these games, I think, I don't think they've done any reading because there are a lot of errors here. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm a, a bit of a prude, I don't know, a bit of sticking them out here, but I, I'd like, if you're going to have a historical theme, you should be as accurate as possible within the con confines of, of the system you're using. So, so yeah, so without wanting to go on too long, it's a case of, first of all, pick something pick a theme which has got a potential upside and then also if it's got a theme do you reading yeah very very good um <clears throat> insight there and i certainly agree with the new research to kind of get that from my feel of how the game should play out because mm. you get some idea well and oh, all that actually mm. what uh, with this mechanism to bring that theme alive mm. um straight me is where there's a disconnect with the mechanism and the feed that just doesn't make sense or why am I just yes. just real well it doesn't make sense <laughs> so mm, yeah yeah wait it's a lot of people mm. but um certainly I'm sure a lot of building designers will uh welcome that advice and certainly do some more research I'm sure they start buying some books perhaps or going on Google yeah no harm in buying books books are good um yeah, every now and again I try reading stuff in Kindle, but I still prefer books. My wife is a total Kindle freak. She says, "Why do Why do you bother buying books?" Like, oh, they're just so comforting. It's just yeah. yeah. It's that it's that feel that yeah, yeah. the touch of uh, feeling something yep. death all for yep. that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's also that. impossible on Kindle to go back and find. You know, sometimes you want to riff, go back to a certain page and find a reference. It's very difficult to do that on Kindle. Um, but anyway, yes. Next question. The, the magic of flipping through books. So we will mm. flip through question, Martin, number four. Yep. So we've had a couple of uh, thinky ones and one nice one, but hopefully yep. this is a nice one. Question number four is, what was the last thing in board gaming you fell in love with? You mean in terms of games? It could be anything. It could be the games you play or the design aspect of it. Perhaps there was a period of your life where it was getting a bit dry or perhaps the, the love was fading away. I don't know. Perhaps there was that key point that mm. you fell back in love with it and that was, oh, that's why I do what I do. Um, yeah, okay. Because sometimes... In theory, it can get a bit grindy, you know, that's like, ah, oh, just doing the same old thing. But um, but for me, that's one of the challenges of game design is to try not to get stuck in a rut and to think, okay, how can I challenge myself to do something uh, better or different? Um, which could be in a, a number of different ways. Um, so there's a game that um, we did on Bloodsto uh, Bloodstones, which was on Game Found last year. The challenge there for me was to create a game with very simple components, but depth of play, um, which I think it succeeds at. Um, there's another game, which is kind of a follow-up game, which I've I, I kind of been thinking through about the physical form of games, because... Um, you know, yes, you have the game itself, but the way the game is physically presented can also be an important part of the experience. And that, that's something I, I, I've been uh, exploring. So we've got a game that's coming up on um, Game Found next year called Steam Power. Because um, I thought, ah, I haven't done a train game for a while. So I want to go, go do a train game. And I thought, um, and I was really, and the, the whole, the core idea of the game, well, the, the thing that gave me the idea for the game is the the clay poker chips in brass. I thought, wouldn't it be really nice if these were hexagonal shape and a track on them? So, you, you know, in like Age of Steam or uh, the 18xx games, you have these track tiles, and they're all made out of cardboard. Um, wouldn't it be really cool if they were like poker chips? You had like proper nice 
model, model trains and really nice model factories. And so it's more like a toy set, you know, but it's done tastefully. It's not garishly done. Um, and so, so yeah, there the key inspiration was examining what materials you can use. And the game itself works really well because it's just a really nice, sim relatively simple track playing game. Um, it's going to be really expensive to produce, which is why we're doing it on GameFound. I mean, we are going to do a cheaper version with, with cardboard because uh, I do think, again, this has got a, a, a significant upside because it is a simple train game, which is still, um, still in very engaging. There's not a lot of luck in it. So, yeah, I, I suppose the thing that I am, yeah, that keeps me going now is thinking different ways of doing things, that intellectual challenge of taking a theme and how do you manage that? Or also thinking in terms of how you can physically present a game. Um, so it's like going back to Bloodstones. It's the thing we're doing in, in Steam Power as well, is printing the maps on fake silk. We can't use silk because my wife's vegan, you see. So silk is a no-no. So everything has to be fake silk, which is fine. Um, and so I, I don't know if there's not many other games that use this, but what it means is just having these really light silk maps. They, they don't crease or anything. So they lay nice and flat. But you can get a whole lot of them in the box. Uh, and they're really, you know, really light. They fold up small. So you can actually get a lot more content in the box by changing the material to use. So so like with Bloodstones, we got five maps in there. Uh, same thing with, with Steam Power. We're going to have five maps in a box that's no bigger than a Catan box. So, so yeah, I, I find lots of things to keep me going. In terms of games I'm enjoying at the moment, the weird one is I'm really enjoying Dune Imperium. I didn't like it at first, but now I really do. But um, I just, yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, that that's the other thing, I suppose. That, that's a game I play regularly, uh, but that's a separate thing. Um, yeah. It's almost, almost like thinking of that spark, isn't it? That, that, that spark relates that love and why you do what you do. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, as I say, it, 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 repeating myself, it, it's thinking through Okay, where there are gaps in the market. So it's like another example. Um, I wanted to examine whether it would be possible to actually produce games in Australia, because there is a company in Brisbane that that like they print cards. I thought, would it would it be economically viable to produce a game actually in Brisbane rather than in China? So I thought, what if you're going to do this? It's got to be a card game, because cards are the cheapest thing to produce. As soon as you start adding other components, it causes issues. So I thought, okay. So it's going to be a card game. And I thought, okay, and let's make, give it an Australian theme. So I came up with this idea, well, let's do a game based on Australian rules football, which nobody outside of Australia knows about, but it's a kind of a weird mashup of rugby and football played on a cricket pitch. It's like three sports in one. It's weird. Um, but I decided rather than doing a direct simulation, we're going to have animals. So it's animal rules football. So it's like, so we have a team of kangaroos and we have a team of cockatoos and kookaburras and wombats and each team has its own strengths and weaknesses. And it's just a really simple two player, head to head, 20 minute, play your cards, battle for points kind of thing. Now, as it turns out, economically not possible to print this in Australia, way too expensive, even though it's just a couple of decks of cards, but the game's done now. And so, yeah, we'll just get it printed in China. Um, but um, I suppose it's also feeds back into when you're saying what, what keeps me going is in the past, I've either done games for other companies or I've been running my own company like Bullfrog or Treefrog. And generally it's been a solitary affair. And I mean, you know, back in the day, Julie would help me you know, to do the accounts and help with this that, and the other, but, but generally it was just like me on my own. And I, obviously I'd you know, arranged to get artwork done and so on. Um, but I've decided to go back into publishing mainly because it's the only way of getting the fighting fantasy game done. But the thing is, it's, it's, you can't do things on your own anymore. 
And so, so, okay, I need a team. I need a team of people. But I don't want to be using people where I just have to meet them on Zoom all the time because I just, I, I just don't like that. I want people that I can meet physically. So what I've been doing over the last few years is getting together a team of people who are all based in Brisbane who can help me with these various projects. So I've got Cassie Simpson who manages my uh, campaigns and just make sure things get done because don't take this the wrong way. She's a female, therefore she's organized, whereas I'm a male and I'm completely disorganized. So she, she, she makes sure the emails get answered and she's very good on social media and yeah, just really good at organizing stuff. Uh, so she's doing a grand job on that. Um, We've got a couple of artists who are working us, a guy called Lace, who's been Walton, who's been working, well, he worked on Bloodstones, who's also working Steam Power. Uh, so he, he's just over the border, border in Mwilimba. We've got Ian Anderson, who's an amazing find. I, I, I met him at a, there's this thing I go to every now and again, a, a get together for video game designers in, in Brisbane that a friend of mine runs. And we just got talking in the bar. He says, oh, yeah, I, I, I'm a graphic designer. And oh, I might have some work for you. And then, when he says graphic design, it's like he writes books telling people how to use graphic packages. So it's not like he's an ingenue. So he's like, he knows everything. And he literally, I'll, I'll ask him to do something. Or oh, can, can you animate this? And literally like three minutes later, yeah, there you go. It's animated. Whoa, incredible find. Um, so yeah, I'm getting together a really good team of people, Brisbane Bears. So what, what we do is every, every couple of months, we book an Airbnb by the beach and we just all gather there and go over the games we're doing so that we can you know, discuss them, play them. So, so that everybody knows what the project is. So they're all invested in the project. So I suppose this, this is definitely something that is new to me. I've never been in this situation before, but yeah, I've got a team and it's great. And they're, they're really good. And they just get on with stuff without me even telling them to do it. It's like, you know, technically I'm meant to be the boss, but they just get on with stuff. And they don't even bother telling me. It's like, oh, yeah, we, we, we just knocked together a new video or we did an unboxing video. And, oh, yeah, we've been working. It's, it's, it's great. This is great. I love this. It's like fine because I just want to focus on the game design. I, I don't want to be doing the daily management stuff. So no, that's definitely given me, uh, um, yeah, I suppose it's helped energize me. And it's like, because it also means with my own team, it's like, we can do whatever we want. I I'm literally at the point where, I'm probably very rarely going to present a game to any other company. It's like, I, I'm kind of done with that. It's like, no, we're just going to think up what we want to do and we're just going to do it. And if people don't like it, you know, we, we, we please ourselves. We, we, you know, we don't, I don't have to worry about going through this presenting games to other companies and seeing what they like. I was like, no, we're just going to do it. Like, like the steam power. I mean, it would not be, economically viable for any other company to produce this game because it's going to cost $60 a game just to produce the thing, which gives you an MSRP of around about $300. It's like you, you just can't sell this game to any other company. But because we're doing it ourselves and because we can do it on GameFound, we can keep the price down to probably about $110, which for the amount of content in the game, I think is perfectly reasonable. So, yeah, so I'm having fun. I say, yeah, I can do whatever I want. It's great within reason. You know, obviously not going to break the law, not going to do anything like that. But yeah, fantastic. So yeah, very good insight indeed, Mark. And yeah. um, people take interest in that. So we will move on to our next question, Martin. Number five. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So let's see what comes out. So question five is: What's something from your childhood that you still love today? Oh, God. Um, well, I suppose the simple answer is I still enjoy games because as a child, I enjoyed games. I think you'd be hard pressed to find a game designer that didn't enjoy games when they were a child. And obviously, when I was a child, you know, you would just it's kind of like Monopoly, Cluedo. But I also enjoyed, because uh, I used to like model, model kits and uh, I used to like figure games and you'd kind of make up your own little simple roles for playing with your airfix figures. Um, so yeah, that, that would be one strand is that I still obviously enjoy games. The, the other thing I enjoyed, um, 
because I was lucky with my upbringing, my family, where we used to go out the weekend up into the hills because um, I wasn't born in Manchester, but we we moved there when I was about seven. So that's back in 1969. And every weekend we'd go up into the hills to go walking. And, and that, that gave me a love for walking. So you know, it's like when I was at school, I joined the outdoor pursuits group who used to go camping and do rock climbing and canoeing and stuff like that uh, and that's still something i you know because my wife is also very keen on the outdoors that's something we do on a regular basis but now we do it in australia which um is interesting because um yeah when I, back in the day when you climb up kinder scout the last thing you'd see would be a rough back snake whereas up here every now and again you see something and you go yeah, I don't want to get too close to that because it will kill me. Um, so there is that. Although there is, I, I, this is wonderful because I mean I live um, on the Sunshine Coast, and we live on a rural property. We've got one and a half acres, and sometimes just for exercise, I'll go and do the circuit. So I can just walk out my front door, and it's a gravel track, half it's gravel, and I can just do this this circuit i don't know it's about seven or eight k's it's, it's and there's a lot of hills involved so it's good exercise and i was doing the other night and i just thought because there was an echidna crossing the road i do you, i don't know if you know what an echidna is um but i, I may want to explain for the viewers who are not so often there uh, so an echidna it's, it's basically a, a large hedgehog um and but there's not that many of them around uh, it's what this what's called a monotreme. It's a very small family. I think it's basically the echidna and the duckbill platypus, or both of what are called monotremes, which basically means their sexual orifice is also the same one they defecate from, as in monotreme. Um, I yeah, don't want to think too much about that. But it's just really cool. Just like oh, there there's an echidna crossing the road. Um, we see, you know, we see kangaroos and wallabies around here regularly. Uh, again, if out walking, it's, there's lots of birds like uh, glossy-tailed um, cockatoos, which are amazing. So, yeah, it's just nice walking out and seeing the wildlife. Um, and so far, touch wood, not being bitten. No. Um, so, yeah, um, so those are two things. Love, 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 love of games and love of walking in the countryside. So she hasn't rubbed off my daughter who uh, hates outdoors, even though I've taken her outdoors at every opportunity. <laughs> We're asking in bed, but there we go. Teeth love. So <laughs> let's move on. Next question, number yep. six. So that's a nice, uh, nice fluffy question there. So question six is, who, in your opinion, uh, this will be interesting, mm. can't pick your stuff, who, in your opinion, <laughs> is the best, game designer in the industry today? Oh, difficult one. Difficult one. Um, it's difficult picking an individual. I think there, there's still some game designers who are still doing amazing stuff. Uh, I mean, Ryan Knizia is still turning out stuff, although it does tend to be more aimed at uh, the more general family market. Um, I say I'm enjoying Imperial June, so I say Paul Denon, certainly for that, uh, deserves some respect because I think that's just a really awesome design. Um, I say Wolfgang Kramer's still turning stuff out, and he's been going for young. So um, I suppose it's, it's, it's also to everyone is like there's designers. Um, who I admire without necessarily enjoying all of the games. So it's like you can't argue like Uwe Rosenberg is an incredible designer and I really like Agricola, and I like Bonanza. I'm not so much a fan of the later games because I, for one reason I was like, you know, it, it's a, but that's a personal tasting. It's not like there's nothing wrong with the games. The games are solid. Um, it's just they're not designed for me. Um, whereas, the, you know, there are other games from, you know, reasonably well-known game designers thinking, yeah, that's just actually not just very well designed. Um, so, yeah, I, 
I'd still probably say Reiner. Um, Cause yeah, he's just a master of the craft, especially just doing the really simple game, which is so difficult to do. Um, yeah. Grover Reiner. He's done so Ooh. many games. Oh, it's scary. I think it's like seven or 800 games. I mean, I thought I'd done a lot. I think there is no way you could catch Reiner up, even if you had like three or four lifetimes at, at this job. And it, I remember I, this a couple of years ago, I, I bumped into him at Essen and he was complaining because there weren't enough hours in the day to work on game designs. I think, Granny, you're crazy. He's just a machine. He just gets up at god awful time in the morning and he just starts cranking them out. And yeah, you, you can't compete with that. Oh, and he's, he's done another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's move on to our next patient, number seven, Martin. Mm. So yeah, I don't think many people will disagree too much. I think he's just done some some mm. in the past, definitely. So question number seven is: What does set up and tear down time put you? So when does set up and tear down time rather put you off playing a game? So at what point? Mm. Does it feel that I don't want to play this game because it's taking far too long to set up? Um, it's definitely 100% something as a game designer that you should be taking into account with your game design. And I know I, um, I've i been guilty in the past. You know, some of my older designs, you know, when I've gone back and played, I think, whoa, this setup time, it's a bit fiddly, isn't it? Um, I think it's like particularly a handful of stars because uh, I played that uh, a couple of months ago for the first time for years. So I'm thinking, wow, it's a 17 step setup. And what what, what was I thinking there? Because um, I was kind of recently redesigning in my head thinking, how can I get rid of those steps? You know, which things can I just through changing the way the components work, just like get rid of that step? Because yeah, too many steps and you lose people. And yeah, I've, I've been through this a number of times. I was like, yeah, I went playing games with some friends um, yesterday. Yeah, Sunday. Um, do a bit of play testing and then play some other games. And I, I'm not, I don't like naming, I don't like naming games that I'm going to be critical of because I don't feel comfortable doing that. So I'm not going to name, I don't mind being positive about games, but I'm not going to name games uh, with one exception. And yeah, there's this game I'd never played before. And yeah, this, just the setup and I'm just like losing interest like too long sitting around it's just ideally that's one of the things I've been trying to do with my own games recently is like how quickly can we get to open a box get the map out get people play pieces right we're good to go um so that's one of the things I like you know with the, with the fighting fantasy game is like yeah choose a character here's 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 the first card this is where you start off you go so it's literally a minute to set up um and i think th that is a key thing in game design so yeah i i lose interest very quickly on setup because i i think it's something that can be avoided now having said that i think i think the worst case of this and it's not really a criticism of the game because i don't like you know obviously the worst case is it was gloomhaven because I've, I've only played it once um i got to my games club late and everybody else was in the game and some people turned up and said, oh, what do you want to play? And they said, oh, we've got Gloomhaven with us. And I'd never played it. And I thought, okay, I should try it. I should try it. You know, it's the number one game in the world uh, then. Um, so, okay, just give me an hour to set it up. Really? Okay, I'll just go read a book. Go grab a bite to eat. Go play another game. I'm thinking. Now, I do get it in that it's a big game. Um but it just strikes me as that that's the kind of game you leave set up. Um, but no, I'm not a fan of set up. And as I said, just, just to reiterate, I think one of the key aspects of designing a good game is trying to reduce that setup time as much as possible, if you can. Yeah, it's a good point. There's another game actually called, which I, which I really loved, it was um, called The Dragon, and it's a big 3D tree you had to build. There, there was actually no way we were just mad <laughs> back up again, so we left it up. We'd be standing there weeks on end, this tree material. <laughs> but it, yeah, well, that would be a function game, and I love how that tree actually interacts with the game. It's not just the gimmicky, actually, mm. what 
we will. But that's mm. one where there's no way you spend 40 minutes every time putting it back down again, putting it back up yep. again. Um, and after that, I mean, it's set up, but I absolutely mm. adored that when I played it. But that tree stood up weeks on end. Mm. On the <laughs> mm. But I, like you say, the exception would be you just like Glenn you just leave it set up. <laughs> there's no way you'd be setting it back up. Yeah, and it's like, and I think that's one of the issues with being self-critical. It's one of the issues with brass is the setup time is a bit too long. Um, but yeah, um, so I, I do I do find myself thinking more about these things. Um, you know, how to just allow players to get in the game as quickly as possible. But, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm all for a quick setup, definitely. So let's uh, quickly move on to the next question, number eight, Mark. Yep, sure. Yep. So question eight, once I can actually open it, and this is one of these little bits. You can never open that. Question yeah. eight. What's your favourite game, which is one, the Spiel de Yaris? Oh, um, Bluff. Uh, which is otherwise known as Liar's Dice, which didn't win Spiel des Jahres back in, I think, God knows, back in the 1980s or 1990s, a long time ago. But um, that's the, it's one of my favorite games for introducing people games to. It's one of the things I take along, you know, if I'm going along. Um, it's just a nice warm-up game, and it just never fails to entertain because it's just full of tension, you know, this whole, are you bluffing? Uh, you know, do, do you up your beard or do you call it kind of thing? So, um, so yeah, I think that would be my favourite um, Spiel des Jahres winner. I'm trying to think of the other ones. Um, I mean, I still I played Catan. I think it was last year because I was when I was back in the UK. I was staying at my daughter's place, and she's got a small games collection. And it was a rainy day, and we're playing Catan. I think yeah, this still works. It's not. I know real gamers don't play Catan anymore, but it still passes the time. Um, it's still good fun. Uh, I think of as a thinking, have I got any Spiel des Jahres games on the shelf? But no, I think it definitely would be Bluff. Yeah, that's my favourite. Interesting, interesting choice. I think I'm going to one um, on my mm -hmm. shelf from Spiel des Jahres. Uh, Magic Maze. Um, mm. uh, I'm sure, I think it did win, and um, it was quite innovative in how that worked. I don't think, mm. I don't, don't, but I remember when I first played it, it depends on the people you've got around the table. It was yep. just so yep. fun when I did play it. I always had that, always mm. a part of it where you, you know, you're trying to move around and, mm. and these, uh, steal the items and, and get back out before the time runs out and you get to work. Right. And yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've not played that. I, I, I know the game you mean, but I, I've not had a chance to play that. I suppose the other one, and it's like, yeah, again, repeating myself, just one, because that one game of the year as well. So that that's another one that just works really well with non-gamers. So that would also be up there as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of really friendly games that come out, and I went there to spill it, definitely. So I'll, yes. I'll so, um, Martin, we'll move on mm. to a question before we go into our scenario. So we're on question mm. number nine. There we go. We'll touch one of the fish that pop out. Question nine is, have you learned any useful productivity hacks recently in your game design? Productivity hacks. Um, the thing is, I because I've been doing this so long, um, I think I've probably done all of the hacks I need. Because um, I know it's like when I... When I um, when I'm playtesting games, you know, if there's somebody new there, I'll give you an example. They'll be like, um, oh, so so, where did you get these cards done? And it's like, well, I got thousands of decks of blank cards. And what I do, because I'm actually in the process of just making up a prototype at the moment. And what I do is I, I, I print onto a single piece shipping label. Um, so like A4 shipping label. And then I um, cut it out and then I peel the back off and I stick it on the card. And there we go. I've got a card. And so shipping labels are amazing because I, I also use the same thing for making counters. So I'll, I'll just, again, print on a single piece shipping label, 
and then stick it on to 1000 GSM card, you know, you know, mounting board, cut it out. You've got counters. Um, I have tens of thousands of wooden pieces all over the place that I've collected over the years, especially from when I was doing tree frog, which where, because tree frog was all about producing again, wooden bits. So whenever I'd have a game made, I'd always ask them to choose to print, produce extra wooden pieces. So I have boxes and boxes and boxes of wooden cubes and discs, um, different shape pieces. So when I put a prototype together, I can do it very quickly because it's like, yeah, I've got my playing cards, I've got my cardboard counters, and I don't have to go rooting through other games. Like, you know, like some game designers do where they have to go scavenging components from other games. And it's like, no, I've got all of that to hand. Um, so I can produce, I can produce a prototype, a decent prototype in a, in a very short period of time. Um, and that's all I really need to do. So it's not, I, I don't even use any advanced software. I mean, I, I do all of my graphics on an old program called Coral Draw, um, which I don't think anybody else would use because it's, you know, compared to things like Photoshop and InDesign and stuff like that, it's positively um antediluvian but it does exactly what i wanted to do which is it's simple to use and i can produce simple shapes and it, it doesn't make it doesn't make things complicated because obviously with more advanced software they have to have all of these extra bells and whistles on so you can do all these advanced effects it's like i don't need any of that i just need something really straightforward and simple being a simple kind of person um so coral draw it's great for what I do. Um, and yeah, I also have a whole load of white boxes that I got printed in the past. That um, So I've got all of my prototype boxes. Uh, so yeah, uh, so this is so all, I have like hundreds of these like white boxes. So this is the steam power prototype. So yeah, I can knock together a prototype very quickly. That looks okay. Cause it's one of the key things I kind of learned very early on is if you're going to produce a prototype, it's got to be done to the highest standard possible so that the prototype doesn't get in the way of play. So this is why you never want to handwrite anything. You want players to be able to play the game and to be able to see the information clearly and not have to struggle with the components so that they're focused on the game rather than the presentation of the game. Um, so yeah, that, that, those are my hacks. Now I can do that. Because I used to produce games, so you know I I built up all all these components over time, um, and there's no reason I, other people can't do it. But because I go through a lot of a lot of designs, it, it's worthwhile me laying in all of these extra components. Yeah, it's certainly handy having them around when you're designing games, because mm. no doubt things go missing as well, don't they? So you don't be. Oh busy. yeah. <laughs> yep. So that brings us to the, mm. the end of our very final scenario. Now, Martin, I have okay. no idea. And you have and no hope, idea. hopefully it's not going to involve me having to strip anything off or anything like that, is it? Because <laughs> no, no. no. We've kept it safe, so we'll just pick mm. one. And then, okay. This is. Okay. And this, is, <laughs> this is an interesting one, okay? So let's, okay. Let's your design test to the limit mm. here. So... If you can make people believe that the Ouija board will bring a magical angel into their lives, how would you do it? Okay, you're going to have to repeat that because that if I, so you've got a Ouija board, and you've got yep. to make, oh, well, you've got to bring and change that how it works to make people believe that it brings a magical angel into their lives. How would you do it? How oh, could Craig? What kind of scenario is that? That's a twisted. That's 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 a horror scenario to bring. No, no, some... no, no, that's a crazy scenario. So, how would I design a game to really or redesign a Ouija board to make people think it really would summon an angel into their life? I suppose I'd have to go in, kind of practice white magic for a while, wouldn't I? Um, I mean, obviously, the technical answer is I'd have to be very good 
at doing staged effects. So it made people think that because as we know, you know, these things aren't really r real, although some people may think that. Um, I don't know. Um, you could do it like a little um, pop-up book, couldn't you? You could just open the Ouija board and a little angel springs up. Uh, that might be the simple practical way of doing it. Or I suppose the other way you do it now, again, there's you do it with augmented reality. There you go. There's your solution. Augmented reality. That that would be the bunny. Um, yeah. Now uh, that'd be interesting. Yeah. To see <laughs> And uh, did I, uh, I don't know, whoever put that scenario together, it's like, what are you on? Yeah, well, anyway. I have no idea the other was ours, so yeah. let's, see. let's see what the future ones bring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, that's only a twisted, a twisted one. That, uh, no, yes. No <laughs> I try to think what games do actually use a Ouija board, whether, whether Ouija boards have been used in board games. Um... Again, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Because there, there is a very negative association of Ouija boards with, you know, with black magic and dabbling in the unknown. Um, whether you could go there. Hmm? Yeah, there's one called, is it Paranormal Detectives? Is that the right. Different pieces to communicate with the ghost. Uh, there's a game it does. Yes, that. like Mysterium, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway. I well, survived that scenario. I kept my clothes on. It's good. <laughs> well done. So, Martin, that brings us to the end. Thank you so much. Mm. That's okay. Enjoyed. My pleasure. And um, I hope viewers out there have enjoyed this. And please don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more content like this. And please give the video a like as well. And we'd like to hear from you as well. So leave a comment down below and what your favourite parts of the today's show were. It'd be great to hear from you. And that brings us to the end. So thank you so much for watching. My name is JC and my guest has been Martin Wallace, game designer of Brass. Until next time, take care. Thank you. Bye.